Alright, peace, peace. It's your man Jeffy Real coming to you live once again. This is part two to Megan of the White Man. Okay? And we're going to be coming from these books once again Black Root Science and Make of the White Man. Alright? It's going to be three parts. Might be a part, might be four parts. So now remember, I show that this gorilla was made by two black gorillas. They call this a gorilla snowflake. And they give you the configuration on how this, how this, this ape came about. The schematics, right? It says albinism and things like that. You know what I'm saying? But we got people walking around like that today, humans, people. Right, they say this is, this is a gene, right? Melanoma, antigen, okay? Now, let's keep on going. So, let's go here real quick. So, we, uh, so we already know that black folks, we are not from here. So, in the book, Black Root Science, it says that the earth is now our permanent home. But we did not originate here. Our ancestors migrated here from the star Sirius, Osiris, 78 trillion years ago. Since then, we have been permanent residents here. So, forget about that reparations bullshit. You ain't getting no goddamn reparations. You want to know why you're not getting no reparations? Because these white folks know who you are. And you more than some goddamn Hebrew Israelites. You're the goddamn creator. You descend from these people. It says, now, our existence here on earth is divided into cycles. Some lasting trillions of years, others millions of years, others much shorter. Presently, we are in a 6,000 year cycle called the cycle of forgetfulness. This era which is near its end, was initiated 6,000 years ago by a God named Yahweh. The same one of the Old Testament. He's called Yaakov. See that? This God made the present world such that black people can no longer remember our ancient glory and the fact that we are gods. He made it that way so, his, so that his creatures that he brought into being can rule us. These are the course, these are, of course, the light skinned races. They have made us a stranger in our own house, which they now rule as if it was their own. You see that? This work of the God Yahweh has resulted in many black people feeling that we not we do not belong here on earth. This is a reasonable belief. Okay? So it says that all black people are a part of the one billion, of the billion, eight million original gods. Those who are the descendants of the slaves are the direct descendants of Yahweh or the 60,000 Elohim. They are the true, to, they are the true to lights, the, cho, the chosen people of Yahweh. This includes all black people of slave descent in all the Americas, Britain and Europe. And wherever else they are enslaved by either whites or Arabs 400 years ago. They were specifically picked out among other Africans and sold for reason that he had discussed. So Yahweh is our brother. He's doing this stuff. We don't worship him. We don't so we, we don't we don't come from here. So now we're gonna go here to uh We're going to go here to, uh, finish what I left off at. Okay.
one second. Okay, so let's get back into this. So now, we're going back here to the book, Make of the White Man. All right? Why aren't your camps teaching you this stuff? Why aren't your camps, all the people who you subscribe to, why aren't they telling you, why aren't they teaching this stuff? Why aren't they telling you about this stuff? What this is all about? Because you don't want to do your own damn research. You want, you want everything handed to you. Give me one second. Like I said, I know what's going on. All right, so let's keep on going. Okay, so it says, real history, symbolically told. Many of the, of the traditions of ancient Near East tell of events and circumstances identical in every way to those taught by Elijah Muhammad. Viewed individually, it is easy to attribute such similarities to, to coincidence. But when collectively examined, the ancient accounts presents a pattern so overwhelmingly consistent with the teaching of Muhammad that they leave no doubt as to the certainty of their meaning. The number of accounts are included in this in this category. Each tale of the birth of a white-skinned child whose arrival signals the beginning of trouble and chaos, and who ends up being driven away from the people and taken to a remote location high in the Caucasus Mountains. Historically, such accounts narrate the birth and arrival of a new race of people the disruption which followed and the driving away of that new race into the hills of West Asia. Such are the details that appear in the history of the ancient of ancient Persia. The history of ancient Persia is outlined in this national epic called the Shahnama. The Shahnama. This ancient account relates an event in which two dark-skinned parents gave birth to a white-skinned son. The boy's father was terrified by the unusual color of the child, and he immediately announced to the people that his newly arrived son belonged to a race of devils. Soon thereafter, a group of men from among the elders of the city issued a warning concerning the child's future. Turning toward the father of the boy, turning toward the father of the boy, the elders declared, quote, this will be this will be to thee productive of nothing but calamity. As in the story of Adam and Eve, a decision was made to remove the child Adam from the region. In the words of the Shanama, the white-skinned boy was then stripped bare and removed from the land and abandoned in some remote place, far from association with man. Thus the child was seized and taken to Mount Albrus in the heart of the Caucasus Mountains. There the boy was abandoned, isolated and alone. He grew up naked and without shelter. Listen to this. Another tradition recorded in the book of Enoch also fits this familiar pattern and states that Lamech's wife gave birth to a white-skinned son. Lamech's white-skinned son likewise ends up in the Caucasus Mountains on Mount Ararat. According to the version found in the book of Enoch, Lamech, the boy's father, described the child as change, unlike, and of a, and of a different nature than those who have lived before him. As in the other accounts, the newly arrived child's skin is said to have been white as snow, and his hair was blonde. The book of Enoch talks about what happened when Lamech learned that his wife had given birth to the uncommonly colored child. In this regard, Enoch chapter 105 states, hold on, you're not, see, see, this is what you niggas is supposed to be learning. 
I keep on telling your ass it's about sexual reproduction, DNA. You niggas don't know what's going on. Don't know who or what God is. Think it's on some damn spirit. Let's keep on going. So Enoch 105 says, quote, she became pregnant by him and brought forth a child, a flesh of which was white as snow and red as a rose. The hair of his, the hair of whose head was white and long. Lamech, his father, was afraid of him and flying away to his own father Methuselah, said, I have begotten a son, a chained son. He is not human, but is of a different nature from ours, being altogether unlike us. Here, the circumstances surrounding the birth of the white-skinned child symbolically represents the arrival of a new white-skinned race of people into the region of the Near East. This is before the flood, right? So-called before the flood 6,000 years ago. The Max father Methuselah, not knowing what to make of the unusual looking boy, went seeking to advice, went seeking the advice of his own father, Enoch. Thus Methuselah went to Enoch and said, A child has been born. Hold on, give me one second. One second. It's sad. You niggas don't know what's going on. So it says in that, uh, a, child, a child has been born whose nature is not like the nature of man. His color is whiter than snow. He is redder than, a, than the rose. The hair of his head is whiter than white. And behold, I am come to thee, that thou mightest put out to me the truth. Methuselah's last statement suggests that there to be that there to be a hidden meaning or symbolic purpose associated with the birth of the child. That the child's birth is only an allegory, allegory signaling, signaling the beginning of some important historical event. Enoch's response to Methuselah's shocking announcement confirms that a change was in fact about to occur. Following Methuselah's announcement, Enoch responds, quote, Then I, Enoch, answered and said, the Lord will effect a new thing upon the earth. So the words, a new thing upon the earth, forewarned that a change was about to take place following the arrival of the white-skinned child. Moreover, Enoch's words indicate that the arrival of the child would bring about a change that would affect the whole earth, that it would, uh, that it would alter the course of civilization. This is much the same as what Elijah Muhammad says happened in, in the Near East 6,000 years ago, and the facts bear him out. In the Bible, a similar change occurs following the arrival of Adam and his subsequent expulsion from the garden. The Holy Quran also says that just before, making, just before the making of Adam, the angels warned that Adam's arrival would only create mischief and the cause, of, the, and the, cause the shedding of blood. The nature of that warning is similar in many ways to the one issued by the elders in the Shanama and the prophetic words of Methuselah to Enoch. In each example, the phrase calamity, a new thing, mischief, and the shedding of blood accurately describes the disturbance that swept through the ancient, ancient societies of the Near East and upset the course of civilization 6,000 years ago. Are these accounts really historical narratives of events that occurred long ago? Let's take a closer look at some of the accounts beginning with the Bible story of Adam and Eve. Let's get it. Alright, I'm going to tear it down now. Now I'm, about to tear, now I'm about to tear it down now. Don't get mad at me. Scholars who agree. An objection might be raised that the book of Genesis has nothing to do with the arrival of white people in the, in the, into the Near East. And that instead, the story of Adam and Eve only talks about the making of the first man and woman. This objection, while no doubt a popular one, goes against the evidence and, and is inconsistent with the findings of all those who have considered the facts. Throughout the years, many people have stepped forward to comment on the true meaning of the Genesis account. One of those who 
who have written on the subject, a great majority of them agree with, with Elijah Muhammad, that the making of, that the making of Adam represents the birth of white people, and that dark skinned people existed before Adam, before the making of Adam. One such writer, Dr. C. W. Shields, devoted many years of research to this to this field of study and concluded that the study of Adam and Eve narrates the birth of the first Caucasians. Throughout his writings, Shield also acknowledges that the human family did not start with Adam. In his book, The Scientific Evidence of Revealed Religion, C.W. Shield wrote, quote, The Genesis record deals with the, with the Adamite Caucasian race, although the human race is wider than the scope of the Caucasians and much earlier than the Adamites. Other scholars have expressed similar points of view. In his book, The Genesis of the Earth and of Man, Reginald Stuart Poole of the British Museum also surveyed the facts and found that both science and the Bible teach that the existence of man before the making of Adam. In addition, Dr. Poole found that Adam was only the first individual of a new variety of a species. Regarding the racial significance of his findings, Poole admitted that Adam, that quote, Adam was the progen was the progenitor of the white race only, and that before the creation of Adam, the black race had been established in the continent of Africa. We we've all we've all we we have already been here. We've always been here. We don't come from here. What do you niggas not get? Dr. J.P. Thompson, another scientist, also concluded that the Bible story of Adam and Eve out outlines the earlier history of the Caucasian race. One of his books, Man in Genesis and Geology, characterizes this view as one possible way in which the Bible and science may yet be harmonized. There are just a few of many of the many scholars who examine the facts. Their studies have led them to adopt positions which agree with the teaching of Elijah Muhammad. In their writings, they have concluded that the Bible story of Adam and Eve relates to the arrival of the world's first white people. They agree that dark-skinned people did not come from Adam, but instead were already, were already in existence at the time when Adam was made. Why aren't your Hebrew Israelite camps teaching you this stuff? Why aren't they telling this stuff? Religion acknowledges the existence of men before Adam. Elijah Muhammad teaches that the earlier history of the white race is set forth in the Bible's account of Adam and Eve. In this regard, he teaches that Adam represents a group of people, white people, and that they were made or first came into existence through black people. In addition, give me one second. Oh, this is going to be deep. I'm about to make, I'm about to make an, uh, uh, this might be four parts. So I want you niggas to understand this. You did not descend from Adam and Eve. Let's keep on going. So it says Adam and Eve represents a group of white people. In addition, Mr. Muhammad says that much of what he teaches in this regard has been known among scholars for a very long time and that he studied the facts will affirm his claim. One clear example that verifies the accuracy of Elijah Muhammad's position is found in the case of Thomas Scoto. Tomas, Tomas Scoto, the 14th century Spanish monk who was put on trial and executed after he tried to reveal information identical to that taught by Elijah Muhammad. Thomas Scoto said that the story of Adam and Eve simply told of the making of one group of people by another. Records kept by the Church of Spain shows that Thomas Scoto was charged with the crime of spreading an an unauthorized view of the scriptures. At his trial, the monk responded to the charges against him by declaring a Latin, he said it's in Latin, ante adam ferent hominis es per elos hominis ferent factis adam, meaning there were, there were men before Adam and Adam was made by those men. Thomas 
Alice Photo endure great sufferings on his behalf of disbelief. How closely do his words compare with the teachings of Elijah Muhammad? Although some may choose to believe that the human family started with Adam, uh, that the human fa family started with Adam, the Bible itself never says that Adam was the first man. Instead, the Bible is in total harmony with the facts of science, all of which show that the history of man goes back well beyond 6,000 years. Leon Pelocchio hinted in this direction when, when uh, in his book, quote, The Aryan Myth, he suggested, quote, long before the Christian era, long before the Christian era, some of the Orish Jewish, uh, some of the Orish Jewish exegetes concluded from certain passages in the book of Genesis that the universe might have had an earlier creation and that and that part of this might have continued to exist. Angels, demons, or men perhaps better, perhaps worse than the prosperity of Adam. A similar view existed among earlier Muslim scholars as well. During the 10th century, the Muslim historian al Mazudi taught that not all men were descended from Adam. To help demonstrate his position, al Mazudi produced a list of 28 nations, all of whom he demonstrated had existed before the time of Adam. In the same century, another Muslim scholar, Al Madiski, is known to have reached the same conclusion. Al Madiski, Madisi cited verses from the Holy Quran as authority for his, for his statements. Quoting chapter 2, verse 28, Al Madiski showed where the angels had accused Adam of being a murderer. According to Al Madiski, the people who Adam murdered were those who had already been living on earth prior to his arrival. Knowledge of the fact that people lived on earth before the time of Adam is found among the earlier followers of Jesus as well. This claim is confirmed in the writings of the early church fathers, most notably St. Paul and St. Augustine. Listen to this. Uh, in the year 1655, Isaac de Pereira. Uh, Ferreri, a sagacious priest of the Orthodox faith, of the Orthodox faith, upset Christian authorities by publishing a book called Man Before Adam. In that book, La Pereri showed how verses from the New Testament teaches teach that Adam was not the first man, and that people had lived before the time of Adam. Quoting from the Epistles of Saint Paul, Perry had set out to establish two things. First, that the New Testament teaches the existence of men before Adam. And secondly, that the earlier followers of Jesus viewed Adam as the first man, only in the sense that he was the first man, a sinner. Adam and Eve are men and women. These are white folks. These are, these are the sinners. So God are the black men and women. These are people. Mm-mm-mm. This is sad. You niggas don't know what the hell is going on in this in this Bible. Or or throughout history at all. Or your reality. So he so Le Perry is saying all this stuff, right? Right? He's saying all this stuff, right? And he and then they got pissed off of him. And they burned his books. They say, but in the eyes of the church, the Le Perry was viewed an enemy, and copies of his books were collected and publicly burned in Paris. Let's keep on going. Let's keep on going. Now this is where it's gonna get good. I gotta make a part three to this. Gotta do it. I'm trying to set you niggas' minds free. Chapter four. Adam represents a group of people. Let's go. So now we're gonna go to the goddamn Hebrew strong concordance. Genesis chapter one, verse one. I keep on trying to tell you niggas that you are God in the flesh. Genesis chapter one, verse one. You niggas don't want to learn. So. Let's go. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. 
Strong concordance. So it's saying here that these gods, Elohim, gods, is plural. It's more than one. Divine beings, gods, goddesses, rulers, and judges. This is what it's, this is what it's saying. Okay? Now, let's keep on going. Let's see. Let's see. Who, so when God gave Adam these laws, who are these laws for? These commandments, who are they for? They're not for us. So it says, many of the Hebrew scholars have insisted that the name Adam or Adam is a plural is a plural is a plural noun. They mean by this that it represents a group and not a single individual. Moreover, that Adam is intended to represent a group of men and women is made clear by the way in which the name is used throughout the Old Testament. Among several examples of those that appear in Genesis 127 and Genesis 5, 2, both of which state, male and female created he them and called their name Adam. Here, the Bible says that Adam is a group of men and women. And if Adam were a single individual, then the Bible would not refer to him, would not refer to him as them. Certainly, a group is being spoken of. But which group of men and women is Adam presumed to represent? Also, who made Adam? And what does the name Adam really mean? Adam made by a group of people, not no goddamn spirits, people. Black folks, niggas. The book of Genesis first, first speaks of the making of of Adam in the 26th verse of chapter 1. I keep on asking that question and nobody's been able to answer. So it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you get down to verse 26, who's writing for God? If Adam has not been made yet, who's writing for God? Because you don't know who, who or what God is. So it says to that, the first book of Genesis first speaks of, of the making of Adam in the 26th verse of the first chapter. There, the words of the Old Testament describes Adam as a group of people who were about to be made by another group of people. People, not no goddamn spirits. People. And God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Listen to this lesson. In this case, the Bible not only calls Adam them, but it, but it also refers to the makers of Adam as us. This shows that Adam and the makers of Adam were in fact two separate groups of people. So now we go going here to the goddamn Bible. So in the Bible, it says, In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Where is God at? Creating all of this stuff. Where is God at? I can't. In the book, Black Root Science. Where, where do, where do, where is, where is God coming from? Is God a spirit or is he a man? Is, 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 what we have been trained to believe in, is God a spirit or is he a man? That transcends time. Black root science. Our earth and solar system were created 78 trillion years ago. As soon as the earth was ready, 144,000 ancestors. Well, that's not the book of Revelation. That's where they got this from. They got this from, from, from our ancestors. 144,000 ancestors came from another star system. The star called so-called Sirius or Cyrus that was worshipped by the ancient Egyptians. They inhabited the earth after preparing it after preparing it by seeding it with plant and animal life. Go back and watch my videos on Forbidden Archaeology Part 1 and Part 2. Something called panspermia. After about 7,000 years since their arrival, 
their population increased from 144,000 to 1 billion, 8 million. The first earth mentioned above was created by the 1 billion, 8 million original gods from the stars of the previous universe. They had existed, they had existed in that previous universe towards its end. Along with trillions upon countless trillions of other people in a state of mind called divine unity or the oneness of God. It is a state of mind where all the people in the universe unite as one. This one is God and truth, not the spirit God of modern religions. You see that? Are you, are you seeing this? So how did God, so how did these gods bring all this shit into existence? How did they do it? The unified mind of people who were, who were, uh, who were as one person was so immense that the stars appeared to be the size of atoms. As this person was contemplating the universe, the, uh, the universal spirit, they saw that it was adequate for habitation as a new earth, with all the stars being its atoms. They made one billion eight million new bodies corresponding to the size of the new earth, using some using some of its substance. Then they disconnected the magnetic connection to the old bodies and left them in the old universe. The one billion, eight million gods then descended upon the new earth and to the new bodies and became the first inhabitants. The matter of every star and planet in the universe is created in seven forms. In modern words, these are magnetism, electricity, light, ether, gases, liquids, and solids. The fourth substance, ether, is the central supporting substance of the six, of the other six. It is the womb of creation called space. It is, it is black in color, as one can see by looking out into space at night. The, this absolute blackness called space not only supports the other substances, but it also gives individual color to all aspects because the color black contains all other colors in itself. When the, uh, hence, when the one billion original, one billion eight million original gods made themselves new bodies, they covered them. They covered them in skin, whose color is black, getting it directly from the ether, because the gods create all plant and animals from their own bodies. They need to have all colors stored in a single color in their in their creative germ, which is called the dark dominant germ or gene, the source of what modern people call melanin. Let's keep on going. Let's keep on going. So now, it says that here, the Old Testament describes Adam as a group of people who are about to be made by another group of people. In this case, the Bible not only calls Adam them, but it also refers to the makers of Adam as us. This shows that Adam and the makers of Adam were in fact two separate groups of people. The English word God as it appears in this verse, is a translation from the Hebrew word Elohim. Like Adam, Elohim is also a plural noun. Like I said, Elohim is, a, is plural. Gods. The gods. Black folks. Niggas. Brown Travis Briggs. Rulers. Judges. Either as divine representatives. Gods. Divine ones. Superhuman beings. Let's keep on going. So it says here that the English word God, as it appears in this verse, is a translation from the Hebrew word Elohim. Like Adam, Elohim, Elohim is also a plural noun. A plural noun. It indicates a group of beings. And it too is both masculine and feminine. G.D. Puckerwork, Perucker, chairman of the Theosophical Society, Lecture on the significance of the word Elohim in a book called Fundamentals of Esoteric Philosophy. Concerning the actual meaning of the word and how it refers to a plur, uh, plur, plurality of beings, Dr. Parker pointed out, quote, the first part of it alone is El, meaning God, divinity, from which comes the second, a feminine form, Elohim, goddess. It's merely the masculine plural. So if we translate 
every single, if we translate every element in this single word, it would mean God, God is this plural. You see that? That the gods and goddesses whom the Bible gives credit with having men were only a group of men and women can be plainly demonstrated by examining the way in which Elohim is used in other places throughout the Bible. A survey of the facts reveals that the Elohim is not actually a name, but is instead only a title. One that in ancient times had been given to the people who had distinguished themselves through some sort of through some act or service. See that? You see that? Are you are you hearing? Are you seeing what's going on here? Um, biblical scholar T. Reed says that Elohim is just a general term expressing majesty and authority. Lastly, R. A. Uh, uh, Felason, professor of systematic theology wrote an article in which he plainly showed that the word Elohim derives from a root indicating strength or might and with this connotation he wrote it is applied in the Old Testament to men. Based on all these facts it is evident that the Elohim were only a group of people. Who are these people? Black men and women. Niggas. We companies black people. We're not bound to the laws. We made the damn laws. So, what does Adam name mean? Adam means white man. What is the real meaning of the name Adam? Many believe that Adam just means man or mankind. But the usual words for man in the Semitic languages generally, generally are not cognate with the name Adam. Instead, the facts show that the name springs from the Hebrew root DM, meaning reddish in color, concerning which James Hastings in the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethic adds, the name having originated in a ruddy race. Are you Negroes understanding what's going on here? I don't think you actually, I don't think you do. So therefore, I'm about to come back and make a part three. Wait till we get into the lost books of Adam and Eve. So it says that by the word ruddy is meant what the dictionary says of it. Pink, color, or reddish. Look at this goddamn gorilla. Snowflake. Gorilla snowflake. What are you niggas not understanding? This, this damn gorilla has phenomelanin. Black folks, niggas have new melanin. You don't know what genetics is. That's what your Bible is talking about. It's talking about DNA. Snowflake gorilla. Let's go back to the goddamn uh, gorilla. Characteristics. All right? Snowflake had a had unpigmented, had un, uh, pigmented skin and hair. So I'm giving you the, the eye color. The eye had a bluish lens, right? A normal cornea and a light blue eye. Irish, iris, right? Which was very transparent, transparent or jerk, uh, or trans uh, illumination. So you got so this this damn gorilla, right, has recessive genes. I'm not making this shit up. The damn the damn thing died from skin cancer. Who was a high who has a high skin cancer rate? White people. White people. What is fee? Me, you know, I talked about this before. I'm going to come back and make a part three.
We have melanoma, melatonin, uh, mel melatonin. Talked about this before. All right? Let's keep on going. So it says that by the word ruddy is meant what the dictionary said of the pink colors of reddish. This is what the name Adam actually means, saying that Adam comes from a ruddy race. Is, as the American College Dictionary points out, the same as saying he was pink or pinkish color or pinkish red in color. The words blush and rosy cheek are also synonymous with ruddy. With ruddy. Descriptions of the white man as red or pink color appear all over the world. In addition, many of the older cultures are familiar with traditions which speak of making with the uh, which speak of the making of a pink or reddish colored man. In the book Ethnic Pigmentation, H. P. Weizmann notes in this regard, quote, the Bantu creation myths describe Adam and Eve as red, which is the most accurate description for white people and quite common in early descriptions of the skin color by dark races. You see that? Let's keep on going. I'm going to come back and make a part three. I might make a part four. The Hebrew and English lexicon also admits that Adam's name reveals the paleness of his complexion. So when we go to the damn Hebrew, Hebrew concordance, Strong's, and we go to Genesis 1, uh, what is that? One Genesis 127. All right? 127, 128. Uh, go back 126. Uh, all right. So you got, let us make man, Adam. Hebrew 120, Hebrew, uh, Hebrew 127, 128. So what is it saying here? I want the damn definition. So it says, Low man, Adam, low man, low degree, hypocrite, right? A species, mankind, ready to show blood in the face. They're telling you. The Hebrew and English lexicon also admits that Adam names revealed the paleness of his complexion. In an article discussing the ruddy characteristics of Adam's skin, Dr. William Justinius writes, quote, the Arabs, dis dis uh, the Arabs distinguish two races of men, one red, ruddy, which we call white, the other black. So in Hebrew, the name Adam is a plural noun. Scholars agree that, is a, that it is a name used to describe a group of men and women. Adam means pinkish red, and the record indicates that it describes the characteristics of white people. Since the facts show that Adam was a group of people, and in and and in as much as that group of uh, what is that? Uh, since the facts show that Adam was a group of people, uh, in as much as that, in as much as that group of was white then it only stands to reason that the Bible story of Adam and Eve concerns itself with the making of the white man as taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So you are Adam and Eve are white people, a group of white folks. So now, I'm going to come back and make another, uh, make another video and we're going, to delve, we're going to delve more into this. We're going to delve more into this. Right?
So it says the white man, driven for some, he's uh, Adam and Eve, that's cast out of uh, Africa. Right? That's where the so called Garden of Garden Eden was at. Okay? 6,000 years ago, in chapter 5, 6,000 years ago, a change occurred in the civilization of the Near East. The facts show that the cultures of that region underwent a change, a period of regression. At about the same time, white people suddenly appeared in West Asia, in the area of the Caucasus Mountains. Okay? Let's keep on going. So now it says that they say that they were drove out of Africa into the hills and caves. So it says, Mr. Muhammad, out, out, okay, so it says here that uh, finally, um, let's see, let's go up here. It says that uh, uh, in the teachings of Elijah Muhammad, it is implied that both of these events are related. In his writings, Muhammad speaks of a disruption that swept through the region of the Near East and which was the result of dissatisfaction. In addition, he says the arrival of the new race, white people, led to additional problems. According to Muhammad, the circumstances surrounding the presence of whites were such soon, it became necessary to remove them from the among people. So the Caucasians were driven away across the desert. Finally, Muhammad teaches they ended up in the hills and caves of West Asia. There they remained for the next 2,000 years. Mr. Muhammad outlines all these events in his mess book, Mess to the Black Man, as to the disruption or calamity brought upon by the whites during that time. Muhammad writes, quote, they made trouble for six months, deceiving the ancient original people who were holy. But when they learned just who was causing the trouble, they cast the troublemakers out into the worst and poorest parts of our planet Earth. Describing what the whites had done to such to cause such trouble, Muhammad explains they, they accused the righteous people, causing them to fight and kill one another. You see that? So, I'm about to stop right here and come back and make a part three. With that being said, peace. The book is entitled Make of the White Man, Paul Lawrence Guthrie.